Alright, so welcome to the last video with respect to the background, the physical background of electrocardiogram and electroencephalography. And we're really finished with electrocardiogram, but wait, don't go yet. We're going to answer a bunch of questions about both, which are really important. So if you're not interested in electroencephalography, just uh, zip to the end of the video and, and take a look at the questions. And really, this is a nice, a nice picture brought to us by Wikipedia of an EEG, which is kind of looked like a, like a sci-fi device. So what we're really going to do is we're going to understand what electroencephalography is about. And basically, electroencephalography is, we, in, in electrocardiogram, we measure the electrical activity of the heart, and we can do that to the brain. Measure the electric, the electric activity, activity inside our brain, our brain. And really what we're measuring is the electrical activity around the scalp, around the scalp, because we can't measure inside the brain. That would mean that we need to have electrodes inside the brain. And if this, this is someone's head, and this is really an awful depiction, but it, I assume, like most people, it ha he has an organ called the brain inside. And within the, this, this brain, you're going to have neurons firing in every which way, in a very random, random way. And it's not going to be very well orchestrated like in the heart. And that is why when you're looking at an electroencephalography uh, graph, what you will see is you wouldn't really see a pattern. You'll see everything going in every which way. You will see uh, you will see random uh, you will see random amplitudes and and random directions. And really, that is why we're looking at at an EEG and saying, oh, this doesn't look very well orchestrated. This doesn't look very very sample, or very um, very ordered or neat. What you need to also understand about EEG is the magnitude is going to be considerably low. We're not going to be able to get inside the brain and measure the electrical conductivity. We, we're going to be able to measure it on the scalp. And we have this little thing called the, uh, the cranium. We have our skull. And this creates an effect of shielding, the shielding effect. And this really means that this skull is really going to, to uh, get in our way of measuring the electrical conductivity. We're not going to be able to measure it to a good extent uh, because of the skull, or as good of, as extent if we didn't have a skull, but we usually do. So we have the shielding effect, and that is why the amplitude of the signals that we read, the amplitude of the electro, electrical activity is not going to be very drastic like an electrocardiogram. And uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the EEG of a healthy patient brought to us by, by the uh, Infantile Spasm Organization. <coughs> So they have a nice website there. And what's also really nice to take a look at is an image brought to us from the NYC Medical Center. And what you see here is patterns. You see patterns. You see distinct patterns. And you're saying, oh, this is well orchestrated. This must be really good. And the answer is no, this is not good. This is the actual uh, uh, epileptic uh, seizure of a patient, of a 15-year-old patient. And you can actually see that all, all, the respective, uh, all the respective neurons or all the respective electrical conductivity measurements are kind of in line. They're in line. And this is not a good situation. This is when we're having an epileptic seizure. And basically, you can imagine that if I had some sort of electron doing whatever it wants, uh, electron, did I say electron? I meant neuron. There's some sort of neurons firing, and they're doing whatever they want, whatever they feel like. If I, so to speak, pressed the reset button. I press the reset button and I induced a seizure and a seizure of an electric event inside the brain. You can imagine that all of these guys are going to kind of align to the same reading, kind of align to the same reading. And this is not a good thing, so I shouldn't really induce that to anyone. But this is how um, an EEG of, uh, of a seizure looks like, brought to us by the NYC Medical Center that have a lot of interesting stuff. Very good. So we finished with electroencephalography, uh, and this is really the basics that you need for our course. You don't really need to know a whole lot more out of that. Uh, so uh, why don't we use why don't we use our knowledge to answer questions? And these questions are brought to us by the Department of Biophysics and Cell Biology with the University of Debrecen. And these are questions from the department itself. So you can imagine that if they are going to ask us questions, they're going to be something along these lines. So I, I, I encourage you to pause this video and ponder these questions, and uh, it would, good, uh, would be a good time to do it now. So let's get started with tackling these questions. 
and what is the physical quantity that is measured by electrocardiogram and what is the magnitude of the signals. And oftentimes a lot of students say, oh, I can actually measure how the heart contracts and how the blood flows and the answer would not be correct, would not be correct. The, in, the only thing that we can measure with electrocardiogram is the electrical activity of the heart the electrical activity of the heart. This is the only thing that we can measure. Yes, that is true that we can look, look, can look at the, sorry, we can look at the electrical activity of the heart. We can say, oh, uh, we, it, it probably means that X, Y, and Z is, is taking place. But we can't really measure other things than the electrical activity of the heart. And, and actually, in detail, you would be saying the voltage difference between the two or the three leads, the voltage difference between the leads. How can EEG leads E EKG, electrocardiogram leads, be arranged. Well, we, we mentioned before, maybe I wasn't totally specific on it, but uh, the actual way or the set standard, uh, the minimal set standard, is one electrode here on the left hand, one electrode here on the right hand, and one electrode here on the left leg. Maybe I put it here in the last video and you're kind of wondering, but no, it's on the, uh, it's on the left leg. And obviously, in everyday electrocardiogram, you will see different uh, different electrodes. You see up to maybe 12 electrodes, or maybe more. But this is the this is the basic the basic uh, assortment you can say. We're gonna keep on going. <clears throat> How do the arrows on the sides of the Eindhoven triangle, or sorry, what what do those arrows of the Eindhoven triangle represent? Well, we kind of went through this. The answer really is that the Eindhoven triangle really represents three electrodes in which we're measuring the voltage difference between them, the voltage difference between these, these points. And really the arrows represent, if I have an arrow here, it represents a positive, a positive voltage difference on this side. So we can say a plus 60 would look like this. Or if we're looking at this electrode here, and this is positive and this is negative, and this is negative and this is positive. And what I mean by negative is pos and positive, I don't mean they're negatively charged. I mean that if, if electrons or if current is traveling towards this side, we're going to read a negative, a negative downstroke. And if electrons are moving in this direction, we're going to read a positive upstroke or a positive amplitude. So if I, I, I see an arrow pointing in that direction, this means that on this lead, on this lead, which is lead two, I'm going to read a, a potential or a voltage difference of negative whatever this amount, whatever this volume is, let's say negative 40, just for kicks. So this is really what we mean. This is really what we mean with the Eindhoven triangle. This is what, what the arrows represent. The arrows represent the potential difference between the leads. What physical quantity is measured by electroencephalography? And what is the magnitude of the signals? And I was waiting for this question. I was waiting for this question to answer the second portion of the first question. And basically, the electroencephalography, when, when, what we're measuring is the electroactivity of the brain, of the brain. We're measuring it obviously on top of our cranium, on the, on the, on the uh, scalp. We're measuring it from the scalp. But this is the electrical activity of the brain. And when we're talking about the magnitude of the signals, the difference between electrocardiogram, electrocardiogram, and electroencephalography, electroencephalography, you already mentioned that electroencephalography for two reasons. First of all, uh, we have neurons firing in every which way, so they're not very orchestrated, so may, they may cancel out. And also there's the shielding effect, and for that reason, the electrocardiogram is going to have a considerably higher magnitude to its reading the, in the electroencephalography. <clears throat> Let's keep on going. Which phases of the cardiac cycle do the various waves of electrocardiogram curve respond to? And uh, we, already, we already mentioned what they correspond to, but we're going to do this again. I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw this electrocardiogram. Actually, I can do it a little bit better than that. The electrocardiogram graph. There we go. Perfect. And I'm going to label it really quickly because it, it may occur it may happen that you'd need to know that as well, QRSNT. There's other things going on, but this is really what you need to know. And we already mentioned what these represent. The P wave represents the depolarization of the atria. And the QRS complex, the QRS complex represents the depolarization of the ventricles, of the ventricles. And the T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. And if you're wondering, if you're wondering where ventricles, uh, if you're wondering where is the repolarization of the atria, well, we already mentioned it is hidden. It is hidden. 
it is hitting repolarization of the atria. It is hitting in this QRS complex because the QRS complex has such high and great magnitude compared to the repolarization of the atria. So we can't really we can't really read this, or you can say that it's hitting somewhere here. That is hitting somewhere here. So what else do we have? What else do we have? Uh, the last question would be, why are the signals recorded by electroencephalography much smaller than that of electrocardiogram? And we mentioned, and we mentioned, first of all, we have the shielding effect. So first of all, we have the shielding, shielding, shielding effect. And second of all, we have, we have different neurons that are firing in different directions and different amplitudes. So instead of, of, of giving us, instead of having the electrocardiogram, giving us a nice, decent, addable vector. These, are, these can cancel out at random. And they're firing at random in random amplitude. So these can cancel out. So these are the two reasons I would say. Hopefully you found this helpful. And I, I really do hope that answering the questions does give you a better understanding of the material. <clears throat> and this covers electroencephalography and electrocardiography for the basics, the basics of biophysics. See you in the next video.